Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Tonight, we've got a late night insight or a quick hit video on Guerlain's Apre Londe from 1906. Now, before I even say another word, let me just preface this video with one uh, disclaimer. This is one of the most iconic perfumes. Whoops. This is one of the most iconic perfumes of all time. Um, it is, um, hauntingly beautiful, okay? It is, uh, striking. It has inspired many fragrances. I think it's inspired other Guerlain's. I think it's even inspired Cherry Vassar to this day, and we'll talk about some of that with my early impressions. However, I'm gonna spray some more on, because this is a very light fragrance to me right now. Uh, maybe this is the modern. I think it is. Um, but... Basically, this was sent to me by Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. I wouldn't be able to talk about this without people like you, so I really, really do appreciate it. Um, it is a beautiful opening. And you know, this time, um, versus the first time that I sprayed it a couple hours ago, I got much more of this white hawthorn flower, but we'll get into this. Um, so... Let me read you a little bit about Apre Londe. So with that disclaimer out of the way, I am not qualified to talk about this at all. Um, this is something that uh, probably requires someone who has spent years or decades with the fragrance to uh, talk about. This is the very first time in my life I'm wearing this iconic fragrance, and this is what popped into my head. So I wanted to do this video uh, because I don't own a bottle. And I probably would not buy the modern. Uh, if I found a vintage bottle, would I pull the trigger? Maybe. But uh, they are extremely expensive. I mean, I've seen some of these bottles go for four figures. You know, you're talking thousand plus to get a vintage bottle of this. And with my current gear long collection, I just don't think it's worth it. If I could find it at a reasonable price, I mean, I'd pay 300 bucks, but I wouldn't pay a thousand. Um... So with that fact that this will probably be never be in my collection, I wanted to talk about it. Also, there is a fragrance that was created by Frederick Mall, and it's called L'Odiver, and it's a Jean-Claude Elena, and it was inspired by uh, Apre Lande, which I actually did not know for the longest time. So, you know, that's the thing about the fragrance game, you're constantly learning. Uh, so I want to read you a little bit about Apre Lande. And then I want to give you my two cents. I hope you guys appreciate this because this is um, an extremely iconic fragrance and it's kind of one of those things like you can't look to the future without understanding the past. And this is one of those Guerlain fragrances from the past that even though it doesn't get a lot of love today, especially not in the YouTube fragrance community, I mean, people in the YouTube fragrance community now are mostly off into their own world. They're not interested in stuff like this. They're interested in Parfum de Marly or Initio, which is their sister house, by the way. And, uh, you know, just crap like that, uh, where they should be focusing on stuff like this from the past. If you really want to learn about fragrances, what better way to do it than to smell some of the most iconic fragrances of all time? So, let's talk about Apre Londe. Let me read this to you. So, this is straight off of the Guerlain website today, October 21st. 20, October 22nd, 2022. Apre Londe, well, it starts off with the scent of nature, gentle and poetic, is the header. Apre Londe is part of Guerlain's legendary fragrance collection, a collection made of emblematic fragrances composed for more than a century by five generations of perfumers. These mythical pioneer perfumers compose a unique olfactive library that the Maison Guerlain endeavors to preserve. Created by Jacques Guerlain in 1906, one of the best perfumers of all time. Apre Londe is a celebration of the sunshine after the rain. Okay. In this bouquet of powdery flowers, that's very true, um, Jacques Guerlain orchestrated its floral note around violet, iris, and vanilla nuances. Of course, there's the Guerlainade in the base, I think. I think the Guerlainade is in the base as early as this fragrance from 1906, but I don't know for sure, but it seems like there is. That vanilla Guerlainade seems like it's already here. 
Designed by Raymond Guerlain, its iconic inverted heart bottle is underscored with graceful scrolls typical of Art Nouveau. Its avant-garde stopper in the form of a hollowed heart evokes the delicate romanticism of this perfumery masterpiece and represented a real technical feat at the time. Okay, so I want to read um, an interesting fact for you. Inspired by origin, it is probably one of the earliest uses of para anise aldehyde. Para anise aldehyde. Again, I'm not a perfumer, so you guys know that. I'm just a fume head. Uh, but it says, para anise aldehyde, whose sweet, warm smell resembles mimosa and hawthorn blossom. So, mimosa is not listed as one of the top notes, but I could totally see it being listed as a note, even though it's not. Hawthorn is listed. And it's a note that Jean-Claude Elena, interestingly enough, played with in other creations like Queer d'Ange. Queer d'Ange is one of my uh, favorite examples of an amazing hawthorn flower with leather. And um, here there's hawthorn in the top. Hawthorn blossom is what this para anise aldehyde smells like. And it says para anise aldehyde was first synthesized in 1845 by Auguste Cahour Cahors. Um, in 1877, Ferdinand Tienman and Hermann Hertzfeld developed an industrial utilizable synthesis method. Jean-Claude Elena reports, analysis and reconception of Apre Londe has inspired him to compose Lo de Ver, which I want to wear and do a video on very soon, but I couldn't do a video on that until I understood this, at least, at least scratch the surface. I'm not going to be able to understand it in one nighttime wearing. And it says, since February 2014, the historic Louis the um, uh, 16th Flacon of Apre Londe is exhibited in the Hall of Mirrors of the Guerlain Parent House at the Champs Elysees Paris. Petty, on request, it is possible to smell the scent, the X ray version, which has been reconstructed following the formula of 1906. Okay, so uh, first of all, they say there's anise in the opening. I don't get any anise in the opening. This anisic uh, para anise aldehyde doesn't remind me of anise. It does remind me of hawthorns and mimosas. There's also apparently a note of rosemary and a note of lavender. And that Guerlain bergamot, that classic bergamot that you know and love from stuff like Shalimar. Shalimar has that big bergamot opening, which is more, this is probably not only one of my favorite vanillas, it's probably also one of my favorite examples of bergamot. It is perfect. The bergamot vanilla combo with some of that dirty castorium is, I mean, you know, but we're not talking about Shalimar, but we are talking about old Guerlain's. And so this fragrance is many a things. It's dreary, it's moody, uh, it's vegetal iris, it's powdery iris. Uh, it, it feels, I was really trying to sit and think, what does this feel like to me? Like, who do I imagine wearing this when I, when I spray this and, and smell it, what do I imagine? And you know what I imagine? Uh, it really feels like I am like sitting in my house, like spying out the window on Mary, po on Mary, Mary Poppins and Mary Poppins is out in the rain with her umbrella playing in the rain, singing her song, playing in the rain, but it's Mary Poppins, okay? It's not just your neighbor from 2022. And what is Mary Poppins dressed in? She is dressed impeccably like the old days, right? Uh, she's dressed like a woman from the 1920s or 30s. Uh, and she's got the, you know, fancy hat and uh, fancy overcoat and all this stuff. That's what I imagine. That's the image that comes to my mind. Fancy Mary Poppins playing in the rain. And um, there is this undecidedness about the iris. I really don't know what other word to use for it. There's this uh, undecidedness in that it's almost like witnessing someone who has a heart that's open to love. Uh, but they are maybe too shy to approach or too shy to ask, right? So they just kind of stand back in the corner and, and observe and watch. It has some of that, maybe some of that heartache, heartbreak, uh, lost love, you know, or love that could have been and never transpired. Um, 
The other thing that's very interesting about this, in just the couple hours that it's been on my skin now, trying to see if I could get some transition, um, but there is this almondy facet to the fragrance. There's no almond note listed. I was very interested, although there is a note of deer musk in the base. Interestingly enough, I wonder if they used real deer musk um, back in 1906 when this was originally created, or even then in 1906, were they already using synthetic deer musk? I would love to know. Uh, I mean, 1906 was a long ass time ago. And, um, you know, there is jasmine, violet, orange blossom, uh, Bovardia, which I don't know what that is, lily, and orchid. And um, so there's this almondy aspect to the iris. And this is where I went off on a tangent because when I read, uh, when I when I smelled this and smelled violet, I started to read the notes of other Guerlains and it hit me exactly which Guerlains came to mind. First of all, uh, the one of my favorite Tonka fragrances of all time, probably my favorite, one of, but probably my favorite, is Guerlain's Tonka Imperial. okay? And Tonka Imperial was created in 2010, I believe, by Thierry Vasser. And this is a lot of things. It's Tonka, it's tobacco, it's that Guerlainade, you know, thing, benzoin, vanilla. Um, but it's also almond, okay? And I don't know why they went away from these bottles. They are absolutely beautiful. They look like a piece of art, even with the Guerlain signature. Uh, you can kind of see it on both sides. It's just beautiful. Uh, the glass seems high quality. Uh, it's, I don't know. I don't know why they went away from this, but uh, it's really good. And... This is very close to the true DNA of Guerlain. It has that, you know, this is a great example of what a Guerlain fragrance should be. And I'm very glad that I stuck with this. I almost sold it the first time I, I sprayed it and smelled it. And now that I've let a little bit more air into the bottle and worn it a couple times, worn it, gave it a full wear, worn it to bed, it's really starting to come alive more and I'm starting to enjoy it more. And, um... The other fragrances that came to mind were also Thierry Vasser creations. One, uh, well, this this entire line, really. I mean, Lome Ideal, the Eau de Parfum. This is what the old bottles look like. Um, and then also this, this is also what the old bottles look like. They've kind of changed some of the packaging, but um, this is what the original release of Lome Ideal Extreme from a couple years ago looked like. And both of these, of course, this entire line is built around iris, okay? I'm sorry, um, around almond. And uh, that almond build of these fragrances, um, it really makes me respect. When I, um, when I smelled these, this line originally, of course, um, it's a line, it's a designer line. It's meant to be for uh, people who are coming to Guerlain, maybe from wearing stuff like Sauvage or whatever it is, you know, uh, Bleu de Chanel, those kind of perfumes. And that's, you know, this is the Guerlain uh, Lomity Al line is supposed to be like a step up, you know, from those type of fragrances. That's the concept. That's the idea. And I didn't understand... Um, you know, his infatuation with almonds in Tonka Imperial and then the Lo Medial line. Um, but now that I have had a chance to smell this, uh, Apre Londe, it really does feel like he has stayed true to Guerlain's DNA, even more so in my mind now. I respect his decision to, to use this almond note even more. Like, I can go back and dissect his thought process on how we got to this point a little bit better. Now, many people still hate this line. They'll say, this is too sweet, uh, this is too synthetic, you know, and I completely understand where they're coming from. Um, but I uh, better understand his thought process as a Guerlain in-house perfumer. Remember, Thierry Vasser was the first non-Guerlain to be the final say in-house perfumer of Guerlain ever. 
it was always a gear lawn. They used to say only a gear lawn can make a gear lawn, right? And um, so smelling this uh, almond type note uh, was very eye-opening. It was a very interesting development in, in Apre Londe. Uh, staying true to gear lawn's heritage, if you will. Sorry, bad gear lawn joke, but uh, it's true. And uh, there is also this powdery violet-like smell, okay? And um, I wouldn't say that it goes as far as smelling like a Parma violet, but it definitely has two distinct accords of both iris and violet to me. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Eura Rose told me that in the past the same ingredients are used... Um, the same ingredients uh, are, are used to create both the iris and the violet notes in perfume, okay? So um, it's just kind of what the perfumer does with the ingredients, how they dose uh, each ingredient that gives off either a violet-like vibe or an iris vibe. And, um, you know, one thing that I did notice is since there's no almond note listed. So if you look at the note breakdown of Apre Londe, on Parfumo anyways, it lists Hawthorne, which is probably that para anise, anise aldehyde I was talking about earlier, rosemary, lavender, and bergamot in the top, jasmine, violet, orange blossom, uh, bovardia, which I don't know what that is. Let me see if I click on it, if it says, nope, doesn't say. Uh, but there's not many perfumes that use a Bavardia note, except for, actually, it looks like maybe they're all Guerlain's. Are they? Yeah, they're all Guerlain's. This bouquet de fawns that, um, this bouquet de fawns that Russian Adam was, was talking about how much he loved during our last live stream is the only other fragrance outside of Apre Londe listed in the database that uses a Bavardia note. I don't know what that is. I'll have to look it up later. Um, but it, um, so there's no almond note listed. The base is iris and deer musk and that's it. Then there's lily and orchid. Those are the only notes listed. This bouquet of, of flowers after the rain is the idea. But what I did notice is since there is no almond note listing, uh, I think it comes from this mushy like heliotrope because there is a heliotrope note in this, even though there is no heliotrope note listed in the, in the, in the note breakdown, I am very positive there's a heliotrope note in here. Uh, I think actually Gear, did Guerlain's website say it was a heliotrope? Let's see. Um, floral notes around violet, iris, and vanilla. Okay, so they don't list heliotrope, but it, I swear it feels like there's heliotrope in here. Did I see that somewhere? Yeah, so um, Fragrantica lists a heliotrope note, but Fragrantica, I don't really trust as much, but they do list a, a heliotrope note. That may be where I'm getting it from. Um, but this mushy-like heliotrope is what I think gives off this almond-like vibe, because heliotrope can give off this almond-like feel. But what's interesting about the heliotrope here is, you know, most of the time when I talk about heliotrope, I talk about the texture being like a memory foam, right? Mattress, you squish it, it bounces back, right? That's kind of what heliotrope texture feels like in a perfume normally. But here, uh, since Apre Londe is Mary Poppins in the rain, remember, um, it really comes across as different from any heliotrope I've ever smelled. It, it's, it's mushy, almost like you're smelling like wet cardboard out in the rain. And, um, and yet, don't think wet cardboard smell. No, think about the texture of wet cardboard. Uh, and, you know, and then imagine like the most beautiful floral bouquet you could ever imagine. The sunshine is out now. Uh, obviously there's no sunshine accord, but imagine that the initial opening with that, uh, Hawthorne, uh, and Anise, 
and herbal rosemary and lavender and you know uh citruses will uh, you know it'll that para anise aldehyde maybe gives you like the very end of a rain shower and now the sun's coming out with the jasmine and violet and um and orange blossoms and so even though i say the heliotrope has this mushy like feel to it it um it it really does bring out a beautiful sensual bouquet and it adds this um this texture or this feel almost like i've never smelled before now one thing that at this point so i went left tangent with the almond and i went right tangent with the um link to Lair blue and the link to Lair blue in my mind from apre londe is huge and i never really realized it before well, I haven't smelled Apre Londe before, so how could I link the two? But um, Le Bleu, which I have the Eau de Parfum right here in this ugly refill bottle, but I don't care because I want juice, not bottles. And I also have the vintage Eau de Toilette, which is absolutely stunning. And if you turn it over on the back, you'll see it actually says that Le Bleu is a big heliotrope fragrance. Heliotrope, vanilla, and semi-oriental and floral bouquet and um you know they both use this heliotrope and iris with this very heavy purple vibe i get this uh much heavier purple feel in Lair Bleu, whereas with apre londe it's much more fresh you know you're just smelling the after effects of a rain shower Lair Bleu is um almost like witnessing someone's thoughts go cloudy you know or go angry or deep Maybe not angry, but, um, you know, it's, it's like witnessing if, if you could smell what somebody's thoughts who turned from positive to negative smelled like, that's what Le Bleu gives me. It gives me this very melancholic, sad, you know, almost like it gives me like this loss of hope, okay? And um, what's interesting is if you think about the, I, the violet flower itself, okay? Because violet is a big connector between these two perfumes to me. Apre Londe obviously was known as a major iris fragrance from the old days. Le Bleu is also known as a uh, iris fragrance with um, violet. And the anise, it also has the anise in the opening. Interestingly enough, there's another connection I didn't even think about till just now. There's also that anise in the opening. And there's that vanilla, tonka, you know, um, uh, guerlainade in the base, right? And, um, and so this was 1912, this came out. And Apre Londe is 1906. But if you imagine the difference between the two fragrances, uh, it's almost like watching this right here. Guerlain's Apre Londe is almost like watching a delicate violet flower on the forest floor and rain dripping from the trees because it's already stopped raining, but maybe the rain is still dripping from the leaves. And the raindrops are just gently dripping on this flower. And you're watching this beautiful nature, you know, this scene that nature set up for you, right? And you're sitting there, you're watching it, and it's a delicate violet flower. And um, you're watching this rainfall gently drip on it. Whereas with Le Bleu, you're watching that same delicate violet flower, but it's being trampled by marching soldiers' feet, right, in the forest. You're sitting there watching the same flower, at two different points in time, maybe. And they're just, they're, they're two fragrances that are like, you know, on the same railroad track, but they're, they never intersect. Like in math in elementary, when they teach you about two lines that would go forever and they would never touch, right? That's what Apre Londe and Le Bleu on, but they're on the same track, right? The train that's holding them together is the same track. And so that's kind of my, uh, very, you know, this has been a very interesting video because I don't think I will buy this. Uh, it's not my style. It's, um, 
way too light and powdery and um the iris you know the irises that i love now uh just seem to give me a little more actually i think i like Le Bleu even a little bit more than apre londe so even though i've said all this amazing stuff about it now i'm going to come back and say i can appreciate it for what it is but it's not for me i know it's not for me uh but getting to experience one of the greatest fragrances of all time is not something that I take very lightly. So thank you for sending this to me, Rachel. I know this is uh, very hard to come by nowadays, and um, I'm sure this is the modern stuff, but I would still love to smell the vintage one day. But um, anytime you get to smell one of these all-time greats, you know, Jonathan and I were talking about that today on the live stream. If you haven't watched the live stream with Jonathan and I, I would recommend you go check that out because number one, he is very, very knowledgeable. Number two, he has a badass collection. And uh, number three, we talked about a lot of pretty interesting topics today. And I think we kind of just naturally fed off of each other very well. And he, um, we were mentioning, um, we were mentioning today these, uh, these kind of uh, tangents that perfume take you down in our live stream. And um, he told the story about how uh, he kind of got into perfume and why he got into perfume. And, um, you know, this is a great example, I think, of, of kind of one of those tangents. And it's a great example of how when you are in your uh, exploratory mode, okay, when you're trying to learn about perfume, first of all, you're going to realize there's a wall of vintage perfume. You can't just go, I want to smell everything. It's impossible. It's damn near uh, physically impossible. There's not enough years in a human's lifetime to smell everything, right? So what do you do? You set benchmarks. And this is what Jonathan and I were talking about. You don't have to smell every single thing, but you should smell as an enthusiast the highlights, the fragrances that change the game, you know, the ones that are considered classics by the insiders, by the people who are, um, you know, who live and breathe perfume. This is known as a classic by the insiders for the people who live and breathe perfume. This is a benchmark. This is a Hall of Fame fragrance. This is one of those, you know, um, if you put a list of the 100 most influential fragrances of all time, this is on that list, you know what I mean? And so, as an enthusiast, you should want to smell these. You should, even if it's not your thing. And that's what this has kind of allowed me to do, and so I'm very grateful for it. It has improved my knowledge of Guerlain greatly. The almond connection with Tonka Imperial and L'Homme Ideal uh, alone was amazing, but then making the connection with Le Bleu, um, I think makes this even more special. You know, I already love Le Bleu. It is, uh, I need to wear it again. It's probably one of my favorite powdery floral fragrances, if that is a category. You know, I used to struggle with it, and after a couple wears, it was like, it clicked. Like, all of a sudden, I went from, what in the world? Why am I wearing my grandmother's perfume? What, what am I doing to myself? To, wow, you know, like a revelation. You know, like, they have that light bulb moment, right? You know, you know when you turn on a light bulb and you've been asleep and the light's bright and you illuminate your, you, you block the light like you don't want to see? You know what I mean? Like, it's too bright. You're so used to the dark. You're not used to the light. Which, is, which would be a representation of like illumination, right? That's what happened with Le Bleu for me. It was like this light bulb moment. And um, it kind of changed the way that I not just look at Guerlain, but look at perfume. Um, but that moment was hard to come by because the first time I wore it, I was like, whoa, what is this? And my wife is like, what is so powdery and floral that you're wearing? And I told her, and she almost laughed at me, like, you're wearing a fragrance from 1912. Uh, and then, of course, I wore it again, different weather, different experience, and it just kind of went from there. And then the more, all of a sudden, by wear three or four, it was like, boom, I completely understood it. And it is a very melancholic perfume, because it's right before the Great War, in World War I. And, you know, so many people, uh, I just, you think about, 
you think about the people who were on earth and who are living and who were about to who are about to approach this moment in human history and in 1912 when Jacques Guerlain made this he said he felt like some sort of uh I don't want to use the word I don't want to use like a uh like a rift in the matrix or anything but he felt like this like the world was being tugged towards some cataclysmic event and it made him very melancholic and he said he felt something that was so profound he could only describe it in a perfume i mean how about that that's one of my favorite perfume quotes of all time so le bleu is um very emotional it's a uh, very uh, melancholic. It's, it's a very sad perfume, you know, almost like you're, uh, almost like you're, you know, paying homage, homage to the people who, uh, gave their lives in World War One, and, and then eventually again in World War Two. these great cataclysms that the world went through, almost as like Le Blue foreshadowed that, you know what I mean? Uh, and, but you have to, you have to you have to wear it with an open mind. Obviously, if you go in expecting your great grandmother's perfume and you you know make fun of this or whatever it is, you'll never understand the the brilliance behind Lair Blue. Uh, but then now I'm even going to say to really understand Lair Blue, I think you need to smell Apre Londe because I think there's a huge connection. Um, I have very rarely seen a connection this close between two vintage gear lawns. Now, there are lots of vintage gear lawns I would love to smell that I never have that is probably going to be impossible. Like, for example, the one that um, Russian Adam was telling me about, this Bouquet de Fonds. He said he loved it, one of the best suede leather fragrances he's ever, he's ever smelled, oriental suede. Uh, there's also that gear lawns, Queer de Russe from the 1800s, 1880s, which is impossible to find. But... Um, you know, Guerlain being one of the oldest and most important perfume houses out there, you uh, you should put this on your radar. Even though I, I can guarantee you if you have tastes like mine or if you have tastes like Rich Mitch's or whatever it is, this is not going to be for you. I mean, you're not going to want a full bottle of this, I don't think. But will you want to experience it even once? Yes, absolutely, you will. So um, that's kind of my take on it. I hope you uh, appreciate it. Sorry I went down the crazy intellectual rabbit hole a little bit on this review, but honestly, I don't think I have the vocabulary to explain Apre Londe, or God forbid when I have to do a, a review of Le Bleu. How, how can I talk about Le Bleu? Um, so, you know, it's, um, it's, it's really the only way I can think of to describe how this fragrance makes me feel. Um, and old Guerlain's do that to me. You know, it's funny because I, I'm, I'm wearing all this shit, you know, I'm, I'm wearing all this new stuff, old stuff, uh, niche stuff, cheap stuff, expensive stuff, designer stuff, vintage, discontinued, and all this stuff out there, and you're constantly kind of learning and discovering, and then sometimes I just kind of pause, and I go back to something like Shalimar, or Mitsuko, or, you know, Le Bleu, uh, or, you know, something like that, Val de Nuit. And it's just like, what am I doing? What, why am I going, why am I subjecting myself to beating my head against the wall when everything I've ever wanted in a fragrance is right there in, in Guerlain, in Guerlain's offerings? I mean, if I had to wear one house for the rest of my life, there's no doubt in my mind it would be Guerlain. Absolutely none. Um, their fragrances are uh, their fragrances are what fragrances for fragrance connoisseurs dr that we dream of, you know what I mean? They, uh, they're special, and Apre Londe is special. Even though I will not be pursuing a full bottle, this has been an amazing experience. So thank you again, Rachel. Thank you to everyone who's watched. Cheers, guys. Hope to see you in the, in the comments below. I love seeing your faces, love interacting, and I love the, um, Love the support you guys have been give, have given me. It's just been absolutely fantastic so far. So thanks very much. Talk to you later. Bye now.